So, uh, up bright and early, uh, keen as mustard, uh, I'm joined by Brett Holland. Brett, welcome to the Talent Equation. Hi, Stu. Yep, pleasure to be here. Even Brett. though it's pretty early. <laughs> you are, you've been up really early. Dogs walk, the whole thing, you know. Um, I've, uh, I've, uh, but either way, it's good to be bright and breezy and can't think of a better way to start the morning by having a conversation with you about all things talent development, coaching and wherever else the world takes us. Yep, completely agree. Um, so, uh, starting point is, as I always do with uh, with uh, Talent Equation episodes, is tell the world about yourself, kind of what's your backstory, what are you doing now, um, and anything else that you think is of interest in terms of influences and, and kind of why you do what you do. Um, right, okay. So, I guess I'll start really broad, and start right from the beginning. Um, very, very sporty as a, as a youngster. Um, any sport going, lots of unstructured play, which may be something we discuss uh, later on. But I remember kicking a football in the garden, tying things against the crossbar, trying to hit it from the other side of the garden, um, playing cricket at school in the nets, one hand, one bounce, changing rules constantly and all that kind of stuff. Um, my predominant sport now is hockey. Um, I'm now fortunate enough to work in hockey on a full-time basis. But I didn't start that until I was about 13. Just had a a really keen PE teacher who who basically um, let us do a lot of things that probably wouldn't be allowed to do now. So we used to take balls down at lunch onto the Astro, we used to take a goalie kit down there with a mate or two. One of us would get in the goalie kit, the other one would just smash the ball at each other. So, um, And that was fun. Um, I then joined a club pretty early. Um, I probably didn't know it then, but um, just come in contact with some really great people who have been really significant people in my life growing, growing up and going, um, moving on from there. So in a really good club environment, I think really interestingly, I started kind of helping out and coaching pretty quickly after, after starting playing. And that just kind of continued through. So university, well, in fact, year before university, I gap year and coached most of the year. Um, went to university, coaching was my kind of part-time income, if you like, kind of kept me going through there. Specialised in coaching as we went through. Um, also picked up most control and, and skill acquisition as a module in my second year. Um, and while thinking about this podcast, Stuart, there's a very distinct moment in my second year where right at the end of this, um, this module where we focus very much on information processing and this input process output kind of model, um, we had a lecturer come in right at the end and said, right, we're going to do this a little bit different for the last few weeks. And he said, there's ecological psychology. And actually, you don't really think about things properly, and it all kind of just happens. And I was like, "What is this going on about? This is why is other lecturer coming in to talk about this? It's all a bit, all a bit strange." But then actually, started looking into it and researching. It. I was like, "Wow, this is really, really interesting." Um, and then actually took that into my third year, and again, I remember very vividly a Vida Boccia that we did. We had to write a piece in a group around um, dynamical systems, ecological psychology, and then had like an oral exam afterwards, and just loved it. Actually, loved talking about the subject. Um, and that kind of spurred me on and become a bit of a passion. And for those that know me, I'm, I'm quite geeky and I'm quite proud to admit that. Um, and then probably more recently, left university, went into teaching, spent four or five years teaching, end up um, teaching and managing an, a group at an FE college, took over the hockey program. Um, after about four or five years, decided to try something different, packed up, went to Australia, spent a year there teaching, and then also kind of through a chance meeting really, end up taking over the junior section of a, a really big club out there called Doncaster. Not to be confused with the one up north. Um, <laughs> I can imagine the weather's very different. <laughs> I did get a few LinkedIn messages. Oh, Brett, you're back in England. Um, no, no, not quite, but we'll be soon. Um, and just, just love the hockey stew. Love being outside. Love seeing people develop and grow. And I think I shared a, um, a story with you when I saw you the other weekend about this one guy who was coaching under 12s, it was a first ever game um, and we got beaten heavily and second game, it was a bit closer. Third game, we actually looked like we were going to win and in Australia under 12s, you can stand on the pitch and coach with them. Um, and this guy went to me, Brett, if we win this game, it's going to be the best day ever <laughs> like this. And I just, just love that, that interaction and being outside and all that kind of stuff. So my goal when I came back from Australia or before I started coming back was to try and make that happen can I forge a career within hockey? So spoke to a few people, ended up getting into independent school coaching, um, did probably everything and anything I could um, to make that 
um, full-time coaching journey a dream and a, and a reality, um, which meant a lot of hours, a lot of time, a lot of miles. Um, but that then led me into tutoring and coach development with my teaching background. Um, fortunate to do quite a lot of work in the, the talent pathway within, within England, within hockey. Um, did a few days with our junior internationals. And eventually it's led me to where I am now, which is at Loughborough University. And I head up the, the program there. So and hopefully in a nutshell, Stu, that's everything. <laughs> well, well done. <laughs> um, very good. It's a good, uh, the constraints of time, but um, it was brilliant. Um, one thing that just occurred to me then is that, um, so you followed what I would describe as a fairly atypical path as a coach in the sense that it wasn't like, right, I'm going to play, I'm going to play, you know, as, as high a level as I can. And then, right, right. Now that's stopping. What am I going to do next? Oh, coaching looks like a bit of a wheeze. Maybe I'll give that a crack. Like a lot of us did. Mm. You're, pretty er yep. you're pretty early in, in coaching as being the career for you. Is that about right? Yeah, I guess so, to some extent. So I still played. I played alongside coaching. Um, and as I mentioned, started probably a bit later than other people who I was playing against. But um, didn't do anything internationally, but I played National League. When I was out in Australia, played a, a reasonable standard. Um, but it was always kind of a thing that I'd do as well. Um, right. And I guess one of my, my philosophies deep down is just you keep doing something you enjoy and work exceptionally hard at it you're probably going to be all right at some point down the line. Mm. Um, and that's kind of how I've gone about things. Um, mm. And then, yeah, coaching has now just got to a point where it is now my career, which means, unfortunately, I don't get to play a great deal. Mm. So summer league is now my season. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I'm now three games into the season. Um, but no, it's just, just the way that's happened. And I'm pretty happy, even though I do really enjoy playing and, and probably do miss that a little bit as well. Mm. Yeah, I suppose the, the I, suppose, I suppose the difference is that um, you've been honing your craft, shall we say, and on a learning journey um, around coaching. You know, in in parallel with a playing career, fairly early in a playing career. You know, at university, that's fairly early on, um, and uh, and you made a decision, I suppose, that that was something that you were really kind of interested in and something that you really wanted to sort of forge as your career path. So in lots of ways, you know, um, that's, I suppose, been quite, that's not a normal path that a lot of people follow. Most people don't really think necessarily think about coaching until playing finishes, if that makes sense, because they're sort of focused on that. But you clearly had this idea that coaching was definitely something you were very interested in as much as you were interested in playing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's, it's a bit of my personality and character that teaching was the first thing I went into. And mm -hmm. I, I do just enjoy that development, that progression, support and challenge. Um, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed teaching. I could definitely see myself being a teacher. Um, it was just that transition. Actually, coaching is what I really, really have the passion for. Yeah. Um, as we've, again, some of our conversations, Stu, coaching is very complex, very complicated. Um, you never quite master it. And maybe that's something that I'm drawn towards as well. Yeah. Um, the fact that there's always, there was always going to be a next challenge, the next hurdle. Um, I've got about two or three to-do lists on the, on the go and they're never going to be completely done because as soon as you do one, there's another two or three things that are going to pop on there. Yeah. And kind of enjoy that as well, to be honest. So... Um, something else you said in your introduction, which I think is an interesting springboard, is uh, the moment when you were um, <laughs> exposed, exposed, is that the right word? I don't know, introduced to um, yeah. ecological psychology. And up to that point, I imagine, uh, having been learning about information processing and everything else, and that all makes like, yeah, that's total sense, isn't it? I get that. Yeah, yeah. that works. And it's all sort of quite logical and quite, you know, quite linear, I suppose, to a certain extent. And then all of a sudden, somebody comes along with this different idea that's far more chaotic and messy. And I imagine at that point, it was like, I suppose there was almost a, a, a moment in time when you were like, this is garbage what a load of rubbish this doesn't make any sense and then all of a sudden things started to fall into place and then i'm putting words in your mouth but i mean tell me about that moment <laughs> it was if you were there stuart <laughs> um and it's, it's strange so i really i remember it quite vividly so i remember the room i remember it was really light in the room the other lecturer who was a great lecturer at the time dr jamie north um delivering the course and this other lecturer kind of came in i remember him sitting on the front of the desk he's like right now we're going to focus on this and kind of it, it didn't make sense to me. I'm like, well, 
where's where is the input and then where is the pro where where is the logical to use kind of the, the words where, the, the non linearity is like that doesn't make sense it needs to go from a to b to c and, and go from that way um and then obviously newell's model um his triangles oh okay well, actually that kind of makes sense and as time went on it's like oh this actually really does make sense and actually the game asks us to do lots of different things and there's lots of things going on and where do we store this information if it is the information processing actually if we break down all the different tiny micro skills that within sport that's a lot of information to try and store somewhere it doesn't doesn't really make sense actually it was really conflicting what i i thought was true before um and then really interesting very similar time to that i did my my level two coaching course uh, and then having to drive to Wrexham to do it because I really need to do it because I was probably behind on my what was your traditional level approach and I was probably coaching beyond where I should have been with my qualification at that point um, and he made a really key point he said like level one you learn about the skills but actually level two we now learn about how to put that in the game and he said like most most games that you do you need to have a defender so the defender's there it makes it more real and everything was just kind of clicking into place and and then I had the opportunity when I left university to to manage the program at the FE college I was working at and it was always in my mind, okay, well, how am I creating a situation that's replicable to all of the game? What's representative? And I didn't probably know that word at that time, but I was always thinking, okay, well, how does this kind of match up? What Am I asking them to do something they would look to do in a game? Um, and yeah, then it all, yeah, as you said, so you kind of all pieced into, into place after being a very, what is this situation? What is this stuff this guy's talking about? Everything makes so much sense before. So I'm, I find myself um, really quite envious <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you had that exposure um, at that stage because that gave, you know, obviously then that kind of reframes an awful lot about then the sources of information that you're going to look for, your practice from the mm. outset. So you're going to be taking that concept, you're going to be applying it and obviously getting the opportunity to get that kind of live in time feedback with, with the participants and almost, you know, test on, on the fly these concepts and ideas and begin to hone your craft. And the reason I'm envious is because uh, I've spoken on the podcast several times about what I describe as the wilderness years. I was waiting for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is having been, you know, my kind of influence was, you know, TGFU. Um, uh, I remember Rick Charlesworth, you know, all conquering um, Australian uh, women's hockey coach talking about designer games and I'm like, hmm, this is interesting. There's something in this. Yeah. And and then kind of just using those ideas and kind of, you know, scrabbling around for scraps of information from whatever sources I could get and, and trying to do something with them really badly, really clumsily. I mean, <laughs> in reflection, I really do think about that. Um, and then only latterly started to stumble across through exposure to individuals and then also through being able to pick up sources on the internet twitter's been you know huge for me as far as that's concerned yeah being able to then start to go right oh yeah and i mean so i'm just thinking about how valuable on reflection did you do you feel that kind of moment was in terms of then your future direction that's a really interesting question because at, at the time I probably didn't think that. Yeah. Um, and then looking back, you think, well, actually that's, that is probably a moment. Yeah. Um, and it, just, just from um, asking me to be on the podcast, obviously reflected a bit more recently about, about the journey and, and all these bits and pieces. And yeah, it probably was a really big moment. And it's really interesting. I listened to um, your most recent podcast with Mark, Mark yeah. Upton, and you had the discussion around, do you want knowledge first or do you want experience first? And, and that blend. Actually, I probably had a little bit of knowledge, but probably didn't know how to utilize it properly. Yeah. Um, and then probably built up the experience. And then actually as Twitter then exploded and all these great, fabulous resources started coming online about constraints-led coaching and all these other kind of um, variations of games-based um, approaches started coming out. I was like, oh, okay, well, I should probably use a little bit of that. And actually, oh, I could probably develop my, my sessions on and, and how I, I coach sessions based on all these great bits of information that are out there. Mm. Um, and if they were available X amount of years in the past, would I be further along in my journey as well? Because very much not the finished article. I'm, I'm heavily motivated and passionate to kind of get even better. Um, but words like representative design, okay, I was kind of 
looking at that at some point, but had no idea that, that was the word to use um, or to really think in that kind of way. And you mentioned um, Dane Newcomb's your funnel of variability, but his, his uh, environment builders. Yeah. But actually having something like that five or 10 years ago would have been just awesome. To, okay, well, check that off. Yeah, okay, check that off, check that off. Instead of just kind of doing it the way that I thought was, was working. Mm. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Let's dig into that a little bit. Um, you just mentioned about the environment builder, Danny's environment builder. Yeah. Um, how do you how do you use that, or how do you how does that help you with, for example, designing a practice or running a practice? Yeah, so um, I haven't told Danny this, and actually, I, I messaged him yesterday. So he needs to reply to a message, so I shouldn't dig him up too much. Um, <laughs> I'm going to try and meet him for a coffee in the week. If you get, um, if, so you get if you get a reply within like a, a day, you're doing very well. I, I've been waiting <laughs> for a week or two. <laughs> He's busy. Uh, I'll back. He's a very busy guy. He's a very yeah. busy guy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's on my desk. I work, so I print it off. Me. It's on the. I've got a little board behind my computer, and it sits there with a few other bits that are really important to me. So when I'm planning sessions, it, it it's just there. Um, okay. Well, how might I manipulate this? How might I manipulate that? Um, is it representative? Um, am I, without going too technical, constraining to afford? Am I limiting the opportunities of people, or am I actually giving the opportunities to to execute skills that might be appropriate to the the situation we're trying to practice? Um, and I guess taking it on a step further, where I'm really trying to go is narrow those sessions where possible for the individual. So I believe I, I know the players I've had in the program this year really well, and I've put some strategies in place to try and do that but there's certain players who um i just want to push challenge um consider things slightly differently so going back to conference um we we're at the other weekend Stuart, unfortunately went there for russell and jaws um talk which was brilliant but we met a little while ago and he he um he introduced the the games within the games mm. kind of concept mm. and i've been, just been playing around with that really um and giving individuals certain constraints and certain rules or bits and pieces within, within the game, but also doing it for different lines. So in my one training session right midfield, your challenge is to score an open play goal. Forwards, your challenge is to try and create opportunities for them to score open play goals or you've got to try and score a tap in on the back post and just give challenges within the session that you're trying to, trying to develop. Um, and we, we are quite principle-based. So just taking a step back in terms of the context and where I'm coming from with the role that I, I, I do at Loughborough. We're in quite a niche situation. So it's a university. So we have a constant change of players. Um, players will come in for three, four, maybe five years. So actually, if I say, right, the game plan is this, and we're going to pass A to B, B going to pass to C. If that's not on, you're going to pass here. And these are all the different structures that we're going to do. Actually, we've just got to get everyone to relearn that every single year because the players are going to be constantly changing. Plus also, one of, my, one of my four big things that I try and do at, at the university is just create decision-rich environments. So if I'm telling them what to do on the field all the time, I'm not going to be creating a decision-rich environment. Um, so yeah, that's um, kind of part of my thinking and planning, kind of a, a strategy or an underpinning kind of level. Um, so that would then affect how I, how I go through and I plan my sessions. But yeah, back to the point originally, it is on my desk at work. Mm -hmm. So I genuinely do my planning on, on my desk. So it is right in front of me. So um, just following that thread for a bit, but I, I do want to circle back at some point to talk about your role at Loughborough because I think it's quite an, it's just interesting about your environment. Mm -hmm. And you know what, on the podcast, we've talked about forms of life before. And I do think yep. forms of life are quite interesting in terms of what yep. your environment is like. Um, and anyway, we'll circle back to that. But just for now, just to stay on this thread, you mentioned decision-rich environments. Um, so I, I love the term and yep. I've, I've heard it before and I think it's, um, it's really valuable. But take me through your process for, if there is a process, um, for designing something you know a decision rich environment or or even it might be easier just to say how bring to life for us like in a session or a session that you would do that is, is a good example of uh, a decision rich environment for players 
Okay, so I guess it, it does, when I talk about the decision-rich environment, it's the whole package, so it's on and off the field, mm-hmm. hockey and probably non-hockey at the same time. Um, when it comes to on the field, we are yeah working to principles, so it's not necessarily, um, as I mentioned earlier, A to B, and we must do this, we must do that. Actually, one thing is to be quite fluid and dynamic, um, and the more dynamic and fluid we can be, the harder we're going to be to play against is also another benefit of that. So the majority of our training is, is game-based in some way, shape or form. Um, and it will always has some sort of outcome at the end of it. But the solution that pe- players will need to find to, to overcome the, the problem is going to be different and be different for different players um, and for different situations. So kind of hopefully within that, they're, they're making lots of different decisions. Um, we'll then layer up with different constraints, change things around a little bit once we think we're, we're getting to the point where we understand it. Um, and then we, we throw in these kind of games within it as well. So actually individual players are then having to make very much different decisions within the bigger game where everyone's making decisions at the same time. Mm-hmm. It might be that people know the game that some of the players are, are playing within it or actually some of them might not. Um, I'll give you one example in particular. So we've got a defender who's a fantastic character, a really big part of the team. Um, and she's fantastic at retaining the ball. So she plays either left or right half, generally for us, to give the ball to her. And you know you're probably not going to lose the ball. But she often does so by winning feet, winning fouls. Um, and that's fine. But then it probably stops to go forward sometimes. So if there's an opportunity to go forward, Are we back again, do we think? Go. We just stuttered for a second. Yeah, yeah, okay, go. great. Um, so at times we, we lose the opportunity to go forward because obviously we, we win the foul, defence then gets set behind the ball. So occasionally we've thrown the, the constraint on the ruling that that player can't win fouls, can't win feet. So she has to come up with a solution to try and play forwards more often. And it's come down to ball receipt quite a lot, allowing that ball to come across her body so she can play forwards a bit more easily. Um, and at times we've told other players, but other times we haven't. And actually at times when we've told other players, some players have cottoned on and they put a bit more pressure on her mm-hmm. because they know that you're not going to lose it, you're not going to lose a, you're not going to make a foul. Um, so that's very interesting. Again, great for her because it's more pressure, more challenge, and she then hopefully enhance her skills that a little bit further. Mm. Um, we also try and... So within these principles, we talk about what are the best ways of applying them. And actually that is a group decision, a group... Um, so to give you, give you one example, we've on transition, so when we lose the ball, we look to something called kill the counter because counter-attack in hockey is, is deadly. It's often when you score the goals or create goals and opportunities is, is when the team turn over the ball and, and they attack. Defenses scramble, defenses are unorganised, it's easy to go forward. So we talk about killing the counter and we run a few, few games that create these unstructured defence kind of situations. Um, and we go through, okay, what are we doing? What's going to be good here? Okay, well, where do we need to go? Do we squeeze here? Do we squeeze there? Do we swim to the ball? Okay, and we, we talk through those situations. It'd be very easy for me to turn around and go, right, we must do this, we must do that, we must do this. Yeah. But actually, when you're told things, Stu, and I'm sure you can relate to this as much as I can, yeah. it doesn't go in quite so much unless you actually in, um, live it yourself, do it, <clears throat> make the mistakes, et cetera, et cetera, instead of just being told all the time. Well, it, 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 it goes in, it goes in um, immediately, right then and there. Yeah. And yeah. and then as a coach, you think you get enormous gratification by going, oh, look, yeah, it's working, but it yeah. doesn't stay there. And then when it comes to the match and they don't do it, you're tearing your hair out because you can't understand why we, yeah. why it's not worked. But and on anyway, the flip of that, it takes longer, doesn't it? It takes yeah. a lot longer for that kind of learning to take place. And if you maybe look at the season that I've had, and again, we shared a conversation right at the beginning of the season around challenge and the challenges the, the players probably didn't face in pre-season. Well, we certainly had those challenges in mm. the first six seven games of the season without finding a win. Yeah. Um, even though actually we played some pretty good hockey and the girls are really buying in um, but it just took a little bit of time to find um, to get really find and enhance those principles we're trying to work towards and hockey did get better and better and better and then after Christmas um, we lost two games which is fantastic and then the resilience that we showed going into so University Hockey Works league structure the league structure then takes you into a seeding competition for the cup 
and then you go through the cup until um, the final or whenever you're knocked out. So a bit like um, a bit like the kind of a NFL works. There's exactly, league, you get to playoffs. Knockout, yeah, 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 exactly. So going into the league, we we, we struggled. We struggled to connect as a group. We had a lot of change last year, so a lot of players left, a lot of new players in. I was new and I wanted to change a few things. Um, so it took, took time. And with my approach being a bit more decision-making-esque instead of set patterns, it was always going to take that a little bit longer. But the challenges that we overcame at the beginning of the year, I think, put us in an unbelievable stead to overcome challenges at the end of the year. So in both the quarterfinals and the semifinals, we came from a goal behind to go through and win. And even in the final, we were fortunate to be 3-0 up with, I think, 12 minutes to play or something like that. Um, we then conceded and no one reacted it was like okay we've still got this it's fine we've still got confidence still got belief and they did put a little more pressure on at the end but actually we didn't look riled we actually looked comfortable and we had belief and all this confidence that we'd, we'd amassed through the challenges that we'd, we'd faced in the previous weeks and months so in many ways <clears throat> probably wasn't by design um, by your own by your own admission, I think, but it wasn't yep. by design necessarily. I, I remember you're right. I mean, we did have a conversation because you were concerned. You flagged it, didn't you? That this is a group of very able individuals who are used to success. Um, yep. You know, and you know, for for the benefit of people who don't understand university sport in the UK, Loughborough is the kind of the sports. Certainly in England, it's the sports university of choice, generally speaking. And there's an awful lot of people out there, myself included, who will be spitting in their coffee at <laughs> hearing that. Um, however, the reality is that's what Loughborough is known for, isn't it? It is. Yeah, it is. Um, and it has been for, for many years and it's peaks and troughs, but thankfully we work exceptionally hard and from not going to Loughborough myself and now being on the other side of the fence and working within it, it is an exceptional organisation to work for. And I do feel incredibly privileged. We're circling back to that um, because I'm <laughs> definitely going to talk about that. But just on that, so I just just carrying that one through. So you've got this group of individuals who essentially have gone there because it's a really good place, um, you know, a really good place to go. So this is a, a you know a, a group of very high quality individuals. You've got two or three internationals in the program as well, and there's some issues with integrating them that I know we've talked about. But even so, they're there. Um, we've got six and, or seven. Six or seven. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yep. I just a bit too yeah. <laughs> um, yes, I forgot. So anyway, so you've got a, uh, a, you know, got a, lo a load of players there and this is a group who are used to winning and you were concerned actually that things might be too easy for them and there might be, they might need some challenge point. And I threw at you some ridiculously crazy ideas about how you might be able to challenge that. As it happened, the transition from previous um, coaching group to your coaching group and your methodology versus previous methodology actually created some of that destabilization and perturbation as it was. Yeah. Um, and that, and that in itself then brought about some challenges around results, which I imagine was quite a difficult time for you um, in, you know, in terms of being new into role and expectations yeah. and managing some of that. We can talk about that. But the interesting thing on reflection is, is that you were able to utilize the difficulty to then yeah. bring you uh, or to, to use that as a means by which to develop and strengthen the resolve of the side, the side that you, you know, kind of feel that was valuable to you later on in the season when it came to the crunch points. Um, what, what makes you think about this is that you often get very similar stories, don't you? With yeah, I don't know if you ever watch America's Game, the NFL thing it talks about like the journey of the Super Bowl winner. Often they don't mm -hmm. have the best, the best. Often they don't have the best. Um, season you know the kind of regular season it's but then they sort of come together in the playoffs because of the challenges that they face kind of mm. just interesting to reflect on that I mean if I had my time against you I probably wouldn't design it that way mm -hmm. uh, as it was a challenge for, for everyone involved right at the beginning but there were there were signs within it that were actually were doing a good job I mean the style of hockey we were playing is really exciting um we we're creating lots of opportunities but not scoring mm. and it, it it wasn't um disastrous in terms of what we were doing we just weren't getting the results and it just happened we played some really we played the three top teams in the first four games and actually I think game five so we played where the league stand up we played first second third and fourth in the first five games of the season um and, and that was always going to be a challenge but you're right that 
that tough run did bring the group a lot closer together and we tried to put a few interventions in place which um, strengthened the kind of the challenge that we had and turned it into positive so I remember one of the one of the early things we did was got a couple of laptops um, at one training session and linked it to some of the principles that we're trying to apply and I go right you look at this one you guys look at that one and then we get some feedback to each other what do you see and the girls turned around and went actually there's some really good stuff going on and actually we do this 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 well but we probably need to tighten this and this and that realization coming from them was much more powerful than if I stood there in front of the TV and went like this 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 is good you're not gonna believe me because it's because we're losing but I'm telling you it's good and actually these two things we need to work on but coming from the players that actually made a, a really big difference and when they fed back they didn't feed back to me because I don't need to know actually the players do so they fed back to each other mm -hmm. um, and we spent quite a lot of time doing that we also had a a bit of a, a workshop one evening where we went and watched the ladies rugby team train and our ladies rugby train are really high intensity it's very loud um, and I thought it'd be a good opportunity just to go and see what, what they do on training nights and then we went up into a meeting room I put three questions on a, a piece of flip chart one was why do we train what do you want to train to look like or what do you want to get out of training then how do we do it and the players and I'd kind of facilitated and prompted but the players talked for about an hour hour and a half on those three things and actually what came out was most people want the same things in training but we probably weren't overly aware that we all wanted those things and the word that i was really pleased came out regularly which was accountability so you need to be accountable for yourself but actually you probably need to help your your mates out, out every now and again and be accountable for them too so if they start to drift off or they maybe had a really crappy day and they're they may be talking about this crap day that they've had. You probably say, well, okay, well, it's part of that. We can talk about it after training. And maybe if you kind of get into training, you might come out the other side and actually be in a really good mood. And since that day, there's been some really good examples of people coming to me after the session and saying, Do you know what? I was in a really crap mood going into training, done training, come out of it. And now I'm in a really good place. Mm. But I think if you, if you have a conversation with Stu, if we were training together and I went to you, oh, I had a really rubbish day today and this happened, this happened. That kind of puts you in a slightly negative place as well. And then, we might put another person in a negative place and that just spreads a little bit. Mm. So we said, we just got to mask it, get on. We know why we're here. We know what we want to do. We know how we're going to do it. Let's go and do it. Mm. Um, and then for most training sessions, that was on the wall before training. We either consciously talked about it or subliminally, it was just kind of on there. And that was one of our things that we we're going to try and work towards. And actually after that point, our training just got better and better and better. Um, we got to some really exciting points. We had some really fantastic training sessions. And that then just grew the resilience. We started putting competition and some consequence in training at the right time. And that just grew and grew and grew. It's, um, it, it's fascinating. that something that you may or may not um, have picked up on here. But um, something that I heard while you were discussing that was, and I think there's a, there's a useful lesson here. And I've, I've learned this lesson the hard way, is when things aren't quite going right, um, so you you know you you're doing okay you know you're getting yeah the team's doing well you know you're seeing things in front of your eyes and it's easy to self delude here isn't it and spot the things that you want to see and but you know uh, you know objectively wow even if you just look at the stats you go back on the video you get feedback from other people and it says look we're actually playing pretty well here but we're not mm -hmm. getting the results i think a lot of people at that point um, their instinctive reaction would be almost to double down on control. Mm. What you did was the opposite. Mm. You doubled down on player ownership. Now, some people will probably think of that as an abdication of responsibility, but in actual fact, I actually think that's quite a brave move. A lot of people's instinctive reaction is, right, we're not getting right. I'm going to step in here. I'm right. We're going to work on goal scoring. We're going to sort it out because we're going to get some goal score. Because that's what we're going to do. What you did, you placed the locus of control in the players and said, right, let's look at this objectively as a group and then work out between us what are the things that we need to try and do. And then let's be really focused on that. Now, immediately then, you're then essentially the servant leader. You're providing mm -hmm. them with environments within which they can improve at the things they've identified need to be, need to be improved. I think that's really powerful. Yeah, and don't get me wrong, we, we did work on goal scoring and that was in there. But, um, <laughs> but they've identified right. that, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. And it yeah. comes back to one of my four principles in terms of I need to, well, I, I think the program is set up and my, my philosophy is create this decision rich environment. And if I did come in and say, this needs to happen, this needs to happen, and this needs to happen, I'm not giving that decision making opportunity to the players. 
Um, and that's, that's where it kind of filters down from, essentially. Mm. Just, just forgive me if I missed this earlier on uh, while I was scribbling my notes, trying to keep up with you. Um, you, mentioned, you just mentioned four principles. What are they? Um, so, they, so being, um, so kind of coming into role, these are the four things I thought was really, really important. Mm. And they sit within the university's framework, but they're kind of how hockey kind of bring those to life. Mm-hmm. Um, and the way that I've got a little picture of how I, how I got them and they're in four circles, but actually thinking about it a little bit further, I don't think that's right because it's one that is the most powerful, which is value the individual. Mm-hmm. I don't see these people for very long and in terms of former life, and actually their stage of life, they've got an unbelievable amount of things going on in their world. Um, more so than probably any other point they'll experience in the future, potentially coming from school environment where they know their friends. They've got some really strong friends, potentially um, leaving home new location, new courses, new friends. Hockey becomes quite a big part for the people that that I get the pleasure to work with. Um, It's quite a demanding environment, so that's a big stress on them. And all the other things, so that they're still developing Um, and all the other bits that are kind of within that, the social pressure Mm. that comes with this age group. There are so many things going on. Mm. So for me, valuing the individual is the absolute paramount. Um, So what one of the first things I did when I got into the role was in my schedule, in my diary each week, I ring, ring fenced three hours a week where players can come and they can book in with a one-to-one, have a chat, half an hour or whatever, and we'll just talk about hockey, talk about anything, and that's ring fenced. That's never going to go away. Um, and for players where that didn't quite work with them, the times that I put forward, I'd hope and hope they'd say that I was always really flexible and we'd, we'd sort out a time to talk. And I'd always start that conversation with, how are things? How is uni? Um, I'd also like to think I know a lot about that person, that person's family. Um, and just to give you an example, one of our, our girls who's in the under 23 program came to me at Christmas. She said she's going to go visit her dad. I was like, oh, dad lives in Bosnia. And she's like, oh, how'd you know that? I said, well, you mentioned it in August when we chatted on the phone. And kind of, I just think it's, I just think it's so, so important. And if it's coaching the individual, you've got to know the individual. So that, that is paramount. Uh, the next one we've discussed, which is the decision rich environment. So actually, are we going to take that player from point A and stretch them as long as possible and get them to point B and let that be as far away in the future and the distance as we can be? But that has to be through a process of making decisions. And Stu, getting decisions wrong is mm-hmm. part of that. Mm. And we've certainly got some good examples of that this season. And hopefully we've learned lessons going forward. Um, and going back to Loughborough, I think Loughborough do this exceptionally well, but... I want to be known for just giving unrivaled holistic support. So I'm so fortunate. I've got an incredible group of staff around me. We call ourselves the team behind the team, mm-hmm. which I know is pretty cute. Yeah. Um, but I think we do a really good job and we are a team together. We work really hard to, to prepare these people, prepare these players for everything they're going to do in the future. And then finally strive for excellence. And that's probably where, where I want to push harder next year. Um, I think the the other three we did a good job on this year and they got us to a good place but actually how do we strive for excellence what does that look like Um, how do we use our performance analysis in that Um, yeah and a lot of different factors within it Mm. Um, we talked a little bit at the beginning of the season about the heritage that Loughborough has um, especially in in hockey and we've we've done relatively well at university level and, and at club level but probably not so much in recent years and we've actually got a responsibility to push that forward and, and, and be the, be the best Loughborough that we, we can be. Mm-hmm. It's really interesting. Again, having one of my, we call them team culture sessions, basically the team being together and talking, doing stuff, whatever it might be. I actually ask them real direct question. Why did you choose Loughborough? And, and what did it mean to you to kind of play for Loughborough? And one of the, the points they brought out is that actually I can say that I've played for Loughborough mm-hmm. because of the heritage, because of the history. And that's really powerful for them. Mm. But on the flip, is responsibility. We are now mm. responsible for continuing that further. And again, that's really, really powerful. Um, you mentioned as one of your four principles, I'm glad, glad we talked about that. We didn't cover it. So um, the unrivaled holistic support. So yeah. talking to you the other day and you just kept talking about various things that you have at your disposal. So basically mm. I think you work in coaching Disneyland. I would probably agree. <laughs> <laughs> Just walk me through some of the things that you have at your disposal that that kind of make up that picture of because so, actually 
I'm, I'm not being flippant. I've always said, um, when it comes to talent development, that uh, obviously the internal factors within the individual, both physical, uh, psychological, um, emotional, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, really, really important, often overlooked. Um, mm. But I also think that the external factors, the, uh, that environment is really key and trying to create the best environment possible. So you talk about decision rich environment, but you're also trying to create a kind of a, a support environment so that almost, um, you know, your, what is it? Um, in fact, Sir Clive Woodward used to talk about this is to create the environment, the, the, the best environment possible for the, so the players can perform. There's no impediment to performance. Mm. And so that environment around those individuals is, is absolutely critical. So just talk me through some of the ways in which you provide that, that unrivaled holistic support. Uh, yeah, sure. So there's a couple of things. And if I forget, Stu, pull me back up on the seminar we did with Sarah Kelleher. Mm, oh, yeah. And when, yeah, they, yeah. when they got us to write the three words down that um, describe your environment, because I, I did something with that, which might double back on um, what we're trying to create. So. Yeah, I think you're turned there about living in a Disneyland. I, I do completely agree. And I, I do feel exceptionally fortunate to have the things at my disposal that I do. So we have um, a, the team behind the team. So we have a support staff, which includes um, a physiotherapist, nutritionist, S&C coach, a physiology intern, a performance analysis intern, um, someone who also leads on our performance analysis. I have a goalkeeper coach. And we're also now engaging a lot more with our sports psychologist, both an individual level and really, really excited to get on more on a team level. We're going to use a five C's approach, which I guess we may talk about at some point. But in terms of staffing, we've got those in and around that. I've also got a program manager who oversees what I do and gives me support. Um, we have a kind of head of coaching and a guy called Tony Hadley, not the guy from Spandau Ballet. Um, <laughs> he is England Athletics sprint coach and an exceptional coach at that. Um, and then we have a sports science manager who kind of overruns everything. So in terms of support staff and people, I am incredibly fortunate. But at the same time, we still have to use those staff. And we as a team behind the team need to work incredibly hard. So we do um, a few bits and pieces. So we, we monitor the workload we, we ask the players to do. And we're very deliberate about the workload that we, we put players through. And we do that in two ways. So... After every training session, there's a, a Google um, form that they get on their phone, which they fill in, which has their RP score. So 0 to 10, 10 being near death, 9 being extremely, extremely brutally hard and kind of works down to zero, which is asleep. Also, they put in how long they worked for and what it was they were doing. So was it on feet? Was it off feet? Was it a match? And each, each of those three things, time by the time it takes them and the RPE, gives us an arbitrary number. So we know that our week is about 2,000 units. So we work to 2,000 units. If we think we can push them a little harder, we work a little bit harder. And if we've got a busy week coming up, we will dip it the week below. Um, as you mentioned earlier, we've got a complicating factor that we have external players that play internationally in other bits and pieces. When they go away on a camp for two weeks, or sorry, for two days within the week, their units jump up to 4,000. So they will do a whole extra week compared to our program in two days. So actually, how do we prepare those athletes? You would think you probably need to dip them down and actually give them the, an easy week the week before, but actually we probably need to get them more familiar with what 4,000 units looks like at certain points in the season. Um, and then we can look to dip them and kind of um, adjust their workload where possible. We've also been fortunate. We've now um, picked up some player tech GPS and now we can cross correlate our internal monitoring with the RPEs with the external stuff. What does RPE and stand for? Uh, rate of perceived exertion. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Go on. Yeah. And it's a very subjective matter. So, um, oh, there's loads of things in it. So if it's an hour and a half session, if the last 20 minutes of the session is really, really hard, mm -hmm. that would probably put a bit of a bias in my mind and my RPE would be higher. Conversely, if it's really hard at the beginning and really easy at the end, it might make me put a lower RPE. Um, if I hear that you put a nine down, Stu, I might think, oh, well, mine was only a seven, but actually mm -hmm. I think mine probably needs to be an eight. Um, so it is, it is subjective and we know that, but actually as a rough measure, it gives us some really, really valuable data. We then meet as a team once a week. So either Monday or Tuesday, we meet for an hour and we talk through each individual player. So it links back to our values, the individual, and we talk through 
the workload of each player. So if someone's come back from an injury, we want to build up a bit of load for two or three weeks in them before we chuck them back into a 2,000 unit a week. Um, yeah, workload week. So the opportunity to do that. Um, because they wear the GPS units, there is obviously the the kind of sports bra thing that they wear. I probably should know the official name, but the sports bra thing. Um, and I've just picked up some dictaphones. And occasionally I'll just put dictaphones in the back of there. So there's certain players who want to look at how they're communicating the game and what they're communicating. So we, we use that. We have the, um, a performance analysis team. So we just get the video and I overlay the, the audio over the video, send it to the players, highlight certain things, maybe just get them to watch it and make their own um, conclusions up. We may sit in a one-to-one and talk it through. Depends on the situation, depends on the person, depends on what we're trying to get out of it. Um, I mentioned we're looking to use the five C's model for psychology um, where the girls will, or the players will do some self-analysis on where they sit on the five C's. So one of which is emotional control, or sorry, is control, where obviously emotional control sits within that. Um, so highlight that someone might have a, a bit of a need to improve their emotional control. We can then facilitate that in training. So for example, if I use you as an example, Stu, if you don't mind, yep. if you uh, struggle to control your emotions against, let's say, an umpire, or if you made bad decisions, you... I don't know why you've chosen me. <laughs> <laughs> Hypothetically. Have you seen uh, me play before? <laughs> <laughs> so we might be able to a training, just facilitate situations where we give you opportunities to practice that. So I might umpire the game, and actually all the 50-50s or the 60-40s in your favour, I blow against you. Mm. So I umpire you badly, basically. Mm. Will that give the opportunity to get frustrated, get annoyed, not be able to control your emotions, and then give the opportunity to do it? Mm. For some players, it might need prepping before that, before the session. With every player, it's usually a bit of a debrief afterwards. And actually talk about, okay, so what did you feel? How did you deal with it? What did you do? Did you, um, there's loads of things you can do. So did you put a bit, was there a bit of um, tape on your stick that you looked at and that just made you refresh your memory and kind of calm down? Did you say calm? Did you self-talk? Did you have a deep breath and all these different strategies you can put in place to try and control your emotions better? Mm. But unless you recognize that's somewhere you need to work on, something you need to work on, and we actually give them opportunities to practice it, it may, it may not get better. Mm. Um, so we're really excited to get that on board next year. The nutritionist Hattie is, is fantastic, um, works on a bit of a team level. So we have long trips up to Durham and to Edinburgh. We're going to have Exeter this year as well. We look at, okay, what does that journey look like? At what points could we eat? What could we eat? Um, other interventions with players individually. So this, this may sound uh, a bit interesting, but maybe writing a shopping list for some people. So someone who's maybe come from an independent school where they are boarded um, and they get all their food provided for them. Mm. They've probably never shopped before for themselves. So mm. actually, what do they need to buy? Um, and going back to decision-rich environment, we need to provide a, an opportunity for them to for them to do that with a little bit of support. Um, with some of our um, international girls, we look at actually what they're eating and when they're eating on a bit more of an in- uh, individual basis. And then we have a physiotherapist who um, oversees the whole performance squad and we try and check in with some of the international girls who have to work a little bit harder. So we've got two Welsh seniors who on a weekly basis will be around 4,000 units who need that little bit extra support and check in and, a little bit of work on their soft tissue, et cetera, especially the front of their shins when they first started moving up to that level was, was really, really tough for them. Um, so I've probably missed a load of bits out of there, Stu, but again, in a nutshell, that might be some of the, the Disneyland stuff that we have the opportunity to employ and play in. I bet that, though, is a challenge in some respects because I bet in terms of you coming into this environment, probably never having had that level of holistic team around around a team before, actually being able to actually get that team to be a yeah. team and get and coordinate that because um I, I imagine they're not entirely dedicated to your program they're working with some other teams as well they're shared across different performance units is that right yeah absolutely so we've got a couple of a couple of the work gifts with hockey with our men's and ladies program mm. then majority of staff so Hattie on nutrition for example works across lots and lots of programs and has a lot of athletes physiotherapists very similar Mm. um so they yeah they have to spread their allegiances Mm. but on the flip of that you don't you don't feel that quite so much at times because the amount they invest into us and actually care about 
the players and the program that we, we we're creating and we've created. Um, it's pretty overwhelming at times. Last Tuesday, we we got together as a whole group, a whole team, and had a planning day. And everyone was just 100% on it. We did some blue sky thinking. What is the ultimate success? Where do we want to be? And the stuff they're coming out with is just just awesome. Um, and then we all know that that's what the journey we're, we're going on, the direction we're heading, and all the things and all the deliverables and processes we can put in place all head towards that. But back to your original question, Stu, this, in terms of, if you want to call it levels, this is probably the highest level of program that I've um, managed. Mm-hmm. So for those who know me, won't be surprised by this. And I mentioned earlier, I'm a, a big hockey geek when it comes to this and probably haven't talked about my, my kind of CPD journey, but I'd say it's quite vast and quite broad. Um, so I do try and take in as much information as possible, look at what the senior program does and try and get little bits of information um, from there. I guess emulate some of that to some extent. One of our objectives is to develop players that will go on to the seniors. The best way to prepare them for what they can do in the seniors is give them as much of a taste of that as possible. Mm. Um, and some of it is kind of, I think this is going to work. Let's give it a go. Mm. Some things do, some things don't. Again, very fortunate in my office, I sit behind the rugby team who have got a very established program and do things very well. And I just touch base with those guys. Well, how do you do this? Oh, okay, well, how do you do this? And not afraid to ask questions, Stu, which I think is a good thing, <laughs> as silly as they might be. Um, the, the, I think the thing about that, though, for me is um, it's very often the case that, um, the, you know, the learning curve for a coach. So you've spent a lot of time um, honing your craft uh, you know, kind of developing your understanding of skill acquisition principles and all those sorts of things, very much, you know, the on-pitch stuff. Um, but what a lot of people neglect to do is to hone their ability to do the off-pitch stuff. So it requires a lot of coordination. It, retu- it requires a lot of planning. It requires the ability to um, manage individuals, you know, who they're professionals, you know, they're, mm-hmm. they're not, um, you know, the, the dynamic between player and coach is, you know whether you like it or not is often you know the coach is looking to the co- sorry the player is looking to the coach to give mm. them some sort of guidance that's the relationship whereas you're dealing with professionals who are working you know have great expertise far more mm. expertise and knowledge than than we would have yep. and and we're trying to work with them and draw the best we can out of them to support our players coordinate it in such a way that it's not going to put them under undue pressure elsewhere it's quite a challenging dynamic that it's very difficult to be prepared for in, in any other way, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think the way, the way we go about it in, in our, what we call MDT meetings, so multidisciplinary team meetings, is that we are just a team and we work things out together. And I guess by design, but also by, by having to do it this way, I've had to draw out the expertise in people, given that I've stepped into the programme. And actually I stepped in really late. So a few weeks before pre-season started, I was kind of in the role. Um, so we had to draw, draw from everyone's experiences. And that's, that's kind of how I coach, how I go about things anyway. So my approach wasn't necessarily the challenging bit. It was how to best utilize it. The principles on which I work towards was, were very similar. Mm. Um, and again, I think we've got a really good togetherness within that team, behind the team. And our physiologist intern, uh, who's staying with us again next year, which is just amazing news. I keep joking, calling him the number one fan. But he still comes to the games, even though he's not technically working. He's, he's doing a master, so he's got lots of um, time pressure on that side of things. But he's come to some away games and watched us, and he just is fully into it. He's got a rugby background, doesn't do a great deal of hockey, but he just just fully into it now. Um, and will come be down at training and, and try his skills out. He's now perfected a backhand. <laughs> it's a little bit of back stick, so it's a bit of a foul. I haven't told him that too much because he's doing really well, so we'll let him have it for a little while. Um, but we'll pick it up at some point. Um, but from that student, that thing that um, we did with Sarah Kelleher. Yeah. So I thought this was brilliant. So she asked us to really quickly write three words down that describe the environment that you've created or you would like to create or you think you've created. And for me, it was really easy. So my three words were progressive. Because I think that, that's kind of something that comes from me. I always like being better and pushing myself. So I hope that spills out onto to what I do with the players and actually probably with the, the support team too. I like us to be supportive. Yeah. So you need to have progression. We need to have support. And then finally, um, I want it to be enjoyable because enjoyment, and I use the word enjoyment instead of fun. And I think it's might come from one of your podcasts, actually, Stuart. I've heard it recently and it resonates with me. Fun is very different for lots of different people, but enjoyment, I think, captures all. And enjoyment is very different to fun in some ways for me. 
So I thought to myself, okay, well, they're my three words. And that's good. I know those. That's brilliant. That doesn't really tell me a great deal. Mm. So I put my neck on the line a little bit and I sent a message to our group WhatsApp that we have. And the girl's got two WhatsApp, one with me, one without me. So I'm sure the fun stuff and the band happens on the one without me. Yeah. Um, so I put on there, okay, girl. So if someone's to ask you, how would you describe our program, our environment in three words, what would you say? Send me a, a message directly um, so you don't influence other people, what you would say. And the responses I got back were just fantastic, to be quite honest. Um, the word supportive came up nine times. So that was, and togetherness was there another five or six times. Family was there a lot, which is really powerful for me. Um, there's probably lots of other words that were in there at the same time. Um, progressive came up a couple of times. Committed, talented, intense. Uh, someone used the word golden, which I thought was quite nice. Um, ambitious was in there. But also the word fun came out a lot. Exciting came out a lot. Um, believing, unity, entertaining. And all these words were like, whoa, that, that, is, that is a measure of success. Mm. Um, and obviously we won the university competition last year, which is fantastic. But I think that for me is as big a success, if not, if not bigger. Mm. And the experiences and the memories I have from this year will be everlasting. That gold medal will be there as well, but actually those experiences will be everlasting. It was a massive takeaway from that session with Sarah. I was very fortunate to work with Sarah mm. for a couple of years as part of the, um, the uh, National Age Group Academy programme within England Hockey and great learning experience to work alongside her, we'll just see her creativity and just do, even just the planning sessions, you know, jumping on Skype and doing a planning session with her. It was like, she, how she thought of that? <laughs> but um, that session she ran, I thought was brilliant. I mean, what I loved about it was it was that perfect blend between kind of sharing information, throwing in video, asking us to, to, to discuss, putting mm. ideas out there. Um, but she, one of the things I thought was, you know, getting the WhatsApp videos, it was a big takeaway. And obviously you took it away as well, you know, mm. big takeaway, getting the girls to just be WhatsApp videos or whatever it is to send them in saying, this is what I think about that. And yeah. using that as an opportunity for you to almost get that kind of player feedback. I know lots of coaches out there, they'll do surveys and this, that, and the other, yeah. but actually there's something much more personal about the player just doing a video and saying, this is what I thought now. Okay. Obviously you, you're probably going to get it slightly skewed towards the positive. So it might not be, you might Absolutely. use a different method to get some other sources of information and feedback. My, my ones were, I wrote down, um, I probably didn't listen to the rules cause I wrote down more than three, <laughs> but I wrote down encouraging, positive, limitless, freedom creativity and gritty oh i love it <laughs> they were yeah, my, they were mine um but i got the I, the grittiness i got from i mean she talks about like the what was brilliant i thought as well um was when she was talking about like when it's grit week <laughs> mm. when the camp comes together because she coaches the under 18s hoping to get her on the podcast shortly actually um uh she when she when it's grit week they don't know it's grit week <laughs> so she oh, only okay. announces it the night before when they're already already on the way <laughs> So we, we try that in pre-season. So we have about six weeks of pre-season. Week four is our, our grit week. And that's when the load's up, um, the intensity's up at certain times as well. It's a fun week. It's a good week to be the coach, not the player. <laughs> is, it, is it gritty for you as well, though? I bet it is. Yeah, it probably is. So we ended the week doing, um, there's a, a big open area in a big hill near Loughborough called Bradgate. Mm. So we finished the week with the, the Bradgate run. And we all do it together. It's, it's a bit undulating as there's hills and it's, it's a challenge and the girls are already on the, off the feet, shall we say, mm -hmm. uh, by that point. And it was kind of do it all together and this kind of stuff. And um, I ended up joining in with them. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if I agreed to it or they forced me. I can't remember. But either way, mm -hmm. we went and did, them with, did it with them. And that, that was good. It was a bit gritty. I had to get through. I had to get through together. Some girls struggled. It was like, come on, keep going, keep going. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, it is probably gritty for me too i'll say but in a very different way yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> well i think it sometimes i i find um when you're doing something you you know you've got to create a challenge point for a group of individuals mm. because you know that you've got to stretch them beyond certainly what they will feel physically and emotionally comfortable you yeah. have to it, it's part of the performance and yes we would agree that this is important so it's not as if we're imposing you know yeah. and we and we're getting them to buy into the idea of going beyond their physical and mental capabilities because it's valuable for them from a performance perspective but i don't know about you but i find that quite emotionally difficult mm. because whilst i like things to be challenging and gritty i also feel for them 
And mm. so I'm, I have to fight myself. It's the hardest thing in the world. It's like being a parent and wanting to kind of save them from the pain. Mm. And I have to fight with myself to not. So it's, it's funny you mentioned that. It's kind of pennies are dropping in my head. Mm. That's definitely what I'm feeling as well. And at the time, you're probably hearing it. You're like, come on, this is, this is a good thing. But you're absolutely right. And that empathy, having mm. been there as a player as well, and knowing that it, it's, it's not fun, but it, it is necessary. And it is going to get you the or potentially going to improve you in the future and put you in good stead. Um, and there's lots of things. So going back to some of these challenges that we've faced and some probably decisions that players have made this year, which they would probably step outside of what we're looking for to make decisions based on that. was, was really, really tough. Mm. Um, and I don't think we mentioned this, but I've got a few mentors that work with me. Um, and on a couple of occasions, I've spoke to one of the mentors and, very fortunate a lady called Tracy Whitaker Smith, who is the trampolining coach, the Olympic trampolining coach, mm. is my godmother. So we, I, I, I talk to her regularly and, and try and get her opinions on a lot of things. So I just have a conversation with her, yeah. so she can look at things very um, factually, very objectively, not in the bubble as mm. we call it. Mm. Um, and it makes those situations a little bit easier, mm. but not by much because they are really tough. Is that and the toughest one, part of the job for you? Yeah. Yeah, I'd say so. Um, you you just want everything to be great and fun and progressive and all this kind of stuff. But you know that at times it, there needs to be little learning pits and there needs to be the challenges and some tough times in order to get to where the ultimate goal is. Mm. Um, and the one we had one that led into box final and that was incredibly tough, but ultimately the, the right decision, I hope. So... Um, I mean, we're probably not just in that context. You're probably not just, you're talking about the tough conversations, the difficult conversations. Mm. Um, but, you know, we're not just talking about deselection um, mm. or what have you, but just to focus on, say, deselection, because obviously yours is a very competitive program with very able individuals who probably all think that they deserve a place. How do you manage the deselection conversation? Uh, so, yeah, that, that comes into the biggest challenges of the role, mm. I believe. Well, mm. that's for sure, to be honest. Um, very different environment in that we have two <coughs> selections, two games per week. So it's relentless. Mm. Um, sometimes three games a week, Stu. So it is constant. Um, going back to this decision rich environment, at the beginning of the season, we sat down in a room together, got them into small groups or maybe into pairs. And I just wanted to talk about selection. What is it like? How does it happen? What gets you selected? What doesn't get you selected? And actually get them to really think about what they want because it ultimately is going to affect them the most. Um, and then head up on the whiteboard, selection with the circle around the middle, and then we just went off from there and we wrote all these different things that are going to mean that you are selected or going to mean that you're, you're probably not selected. With a little thing at the bottom around, well, if, if it doesn't, it's not captured any of the little circles, what happens then? Um, we have a leadership group and they said, right, we need to go to the leadership group. Um, so that was really enlightening. Um, with a few ways that we do it. So on a Monday, we do selection for Wednesday. And we always take 16 players. Again, this Disney world that I live in, we're <laughs> always able to take 16 the maximum. Uh, what, you mean you're not scrabbling around on a Friday night, seeing, trying to see who's available and who, <laughs> who can get out of their childcare situation in order to be able to play? You don't have that scenario. No, I've been there and done that. And as fun <laughs> as that was, I do like the fact that we can always take 16. Um, but and yeah, so, so we do selection on Monday for Wednesday. And then we do what we call the provisional squad on Monday, ready for the weekend. Mm. So roughly we have 16, 17, 18, maybe 19, 20 players um, on that provisional squad who may play on the Saturday. Um, so we you can kind of balance and, and kind of pre-plan. So it might be that we're off to Durham on Saturday and the twos are at home at 11 o'clock. And that will obviously influence how you then plan your life around it. So as much as I'd love them to be 100% hockey, I believe they do have a life outside of it. Mm -hmm. I've told mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and they'll probably tell you that I think that way as well if you ask them um, so so we do that back to your point earlier Stu so we have about 26 27 within what I what we call the performance squad and we all train together we for all intents and purposes we are the squad and we are the bigger squad and when we did the the three word descriptors they all put the words in and they, they all put together as a family. And that is one of the overarching um, fundamentals of what we do. We are a family. And when girls come in and spend a day with us, they always come back and say that 
how friendly they all were when they came to the training sessions and how much of a family feel there is. Um, but that also makes it really difficult because mm -hmm. I think all of those 26, 27 girls are all good enough, if not better than what they need to be to play at the levels that we play at. Mm -hmm. But I can only select 16 at any one time. Try to reduce all the uncertainty, as much uncertainty as possible. And we then have what I've called role descriptors, which isn't particularly sexy, Stu, but it was a word I came up with when I was writing them. Mm. And that just lists kind of three or four bullet points of a real kind of, okay, I don't want to use the word principle, but kind of, kind of overarching thing that you want a certain person to do. So to give you an example, a couple of ones from our forwards is to be fit and fast, get ahead, carry the ball really aggressively forwards and get positive outcomes at the end. So that's not, you must always attack down the right and go on your forehand and enter the baseline. That is, you need to go forward fast. Whatever way that works for you in the situation, that's what we need you to do. We're also looking for our forwards to be threatening in the D. So again, that could be hitting, diving deflections, backhands, backspace, and all these hockey skills that they might have amassed. Or it might be they've got one skill, but they're so bloody good at it, that makes them a threat in the D. Mm. And then finally, we've got some defensive elements to our forwards. And when it comes to selection, those are the role descriptors that I use. So I will pick players who are just doing those better at that point. Or, especially with the forwards, because we had quite a lot of forwards last year, I will pick players who, um, within the squad of five that we take, enough of them hit the, our best at those areas. So we have a couple players who are exceptionally threatening in the D. We've got a couple players who are very good carrying the ball forward. And we've got a couple of players who are exceptionally good defensively. So I might pick an amalgamation of those five um so we satisfy all those road descriptors mm -hmm. which again is a challenge because i might come in i might be really good at all of them but i might not have a super strength in one and therefore i might just miss out every now and again because someone gets picked me on that one and someone gets picked me on that one and it's, it's a big challenge but we we're really open and really clear that this is the way we're going to do it so when i have conversations around not being selected those are the, those are what we talk about in the situations then we also have some times where certain teams we play against, um, and again, Disneyland, we're pretty good at opposition analysis. We have video from previous few years. We know what we're likely to experience. So do they play a zonal press? Are they man-to-man? -man? Do they high press, deep, goalkeepers, short corners? We have a rough idea of what we need to do to, to win. There might be some players who have certain skills that work better against the team compared to others that work better against another team which again, it's a real big challenge because one player might think, well, I'm, I'm in a better place than the other player, but you are. But actually for this game, this skill is going to be really important. So we don't have anyone with a huge area, but it might be that a team really high presses us and an aerial skill where they can just flick it over the top of everyone becomes a really valuable skill for that game. Mm. If a team sits back, when actually that skill is, is kind of redundant or isn't quite as important. So I might pick someone who can play more intricate passes or, or do some different kinds of skills. And again, very fortunate I've got a really big player base to pick from and choose from. Yeah. And next year, I've got some exceptionally talented players coming to the programme again. Um, and probably more excitingly, I've got some characters that I can't wait to get into the environment because I think they're just going to enhance what we do mm. and are really going to buy in from, from knowing them and experiences around the talent pathway and, and that kind of stuff. I just know they're just going to fit so well with what we're trying to do. Mm. Brilliant. It's going to make it different. It's going to make it very difficult. <laughs> at the same time good problem yeah i suppose that's the that's the goal isn't it i mean having worked in talent development a long time you know one of the things i always said that you know the goal was to try and make the people above me who've got to make tough selections and make their job as hard as possible yep you know i almost take pleasure in the fact that there's this oversupply of of, of, of quality yeah you, you never it's rare well i say rare i mean it, that, that's a fairly unique situation to be in i think as a coach mm. when you've got this you know supply of, of talented individuals mm. and um, you know most of us who've worked say in club land for example um, you know even working at like national league level coaching at club mm. land you oh, know yeah. it, I've got you know coaching guys who've got you know fairly into you know, some of them are doctors some of them are lawyers you know and some of them are people working in business traveling all parts of the world and you know they come along and they're committing to train as many times as many you know for three hours a week for whatever it might be and they're committing to get a game but even within that context you know you, you pretty much know the the core kind of 11 12 13 yeah. players that are going to be part of your squad and everyone kind of knows that so yeah to give a bit of context then so we play in two competitions mm. a wednesday university league and a saturday club league mm. within the wednesday league we used 30 players right over a 14 game season 
-hmm. We then used 25 players in the Saturday League over what was probably a 18 game season. Mm. And that, that's through form yeah. the teams are playing against, injuries, unavailability, international commitments. I'm, I've probably got, I've got a little color coded um, spreadsheet, which my, my line manager loves because she thinks I'm really organized and all this kind of stuff goes everywhere. And I've got a color which is just miscellaneous because other things that just affect people's availability. Mm. Um, but I, I met my, the basketball coach at Loughborough yesterday for a coffee. Um, he made a really good comment to me, and I think this might apply to us next year. So often the, the coach makes selection decisions, which ultimately that's kind of who puts the signs on the dotted line. But actually next year, it might well be the players that make the selection decisions. The players that are fully committed to the program, they do everything they need to do and, and will outcompete other people, might just make themselves selected. Um, and even though I'm, I'm looking ahead thinking this is going to be a real big challenge, it may become really obvious and mm. the players that do what they need to do and, and more will then just out-compete and the players end up doing the selection for me. And that's a real mind uh, mindset shift, isn't it? Mm. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I used to say that um, to, you know, in, in an effort to, you know, kind of develop the group and whatever. I used to say, your job is to make yourself un undeselectable. Yep. Um, and if you're not part of that group, so you're not selected, then your job is to make yourself more selectable than the person who's been selected. Mm. Um, and so that that person in that group there knows that you're breathing down their neck or these people who you could potentially take the place of, it's your job to mm. be, because I've always been a big believer when it's a de deselection conversation is to say, this is close. I've had mm. to make a judgment call. You've got strengths. They've got strengths. Uh, this is not about you as an individual or, you know, this is not a judgment call on your, on, on anything about you as a, as a character necessarily. This is about a, 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 a range of abilities and qualities that mean for this particular moment, this individual has the edge. However, that can change. It's mm. not fixed, you know, and it's not always going to be that way. And it's very much down to you, what you now decide to do decision, rich, you now decide to do in order to bring about a change of circumstance. Mm. Again, the I'm just going to jump in there, Stu, and I think these role descriptors that we put forward are really great for the hockey mm. because it's really clear, okay, I need to work on these, these, these. And actually two things. Our culture is starting to breed that now. Mm -hmm. So I had a one-to-one -one with a fantastic character uh, within, within our group. Right at the end of the season, I was assuming it'd be, okay, what do I need to do to get selected in the last couple of games? But actually one of the first questions is, over our summer training, so we do six weeks of training at the end of the season because we have the opportunity to do so, what do I need to do to get better? And mm. I was like... Well, if this is what we're creating, then I'm, I'm really, really happy. Um, but on the flip of that, when we look to do these role descriptors next year, what I haven't included and what I definitely need to include is the other things away from stuff on the pitch. Mm. So what do they bring to the team? What do they do when they're on the bench? What do they do in the build-up? How well are they preparing for games? And actually, that might become a bigger selection factor than the hockey itself. And this really... well. Again, this coffee that I had with Mark yesterday, he said his 12th player, so basketball team, 12th player rarely plays, his 12th player was the player of the season because he led everything in training. He pushed everyone to the best they could be. Match day, he was the one bringing the energy. He would high-five people coming off the bench and thank them for the effort they put on on the, on the pitch. He would give prompts. He would give in the, the coaching points or the principles they're trying to work towards. And he was just this character who was just, undroppable mm. but didn't play mm. <laughs> a great deal of, of basketball mm. um, and I'm like wow I've really overlooked this this is something that I think is absolutely vital and going into next year could be incredibly vital and we had a game um, in fact our first win of the season I think it might have been um, against a very very good university who the weekend before we'd lost to heavily mm. um, and we, we got a chance to play them again on the Wednesday and the girls were so fired up we were, we want this. We're at home, played away on the Saturday, home on the Wednesday. And the biggest thing that stood out for me for that game is that every single person was noisy on the pitch and off the pitch. Mm -hmm. So all five players on the bench were engaged, were given information, were positive, were diligent, all these great things. Um, and we, we came on, we, we won 5 0, and it was just domination. We kept the ball. Was a, I've got it on my, um, my performance analysis, my video. There's a five minute clip where we turned over the ball three times 
but yeah, we only we only didn't have the ball eighteen seconds. <laughs> we won the ball back, kept it, won the ball back, kept it, won the ball back, kept it, scored, and it is just yeah. Still trying to replicate it and go for it again, but it happened, <laughs> so that's a good thing. I think I think that's a um, it's a really useful um, point actually you've made there, which is and again I think something often overlooked, which is you know we we're, we're very we very often make selection decisions based on um, at the the sort of technical or tactical performance capabilities, and we can be mm. clear about those. But it's again if we're trying to be robust about culture uh, and also the behaviours that make up our cult, you know, day-to-day behaviors that make up yep. or, or kind of bring to life what our culture is. It's not just a nebulous concept. It's actually, this is how we behave to bring about our culture, you know, day-to-day in, in sessions, you know, and this is where things like, you know, Mark Bennett's rules, rule of three and, or well, I might come up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah or wh- whatever it is, you know, if you're living and breathing those things and people mm-hmm. who are bought into that kind of cultural concept around being a very strong and vocal communicator and being supportive with the group and all those sorts of things. I'm not saying that's the only selection criteria you would use because you still, like you say, you still going you still want, a level of ability but given that a lot of your players are going to be at relatively equal levels of ability you know give or take a few things it could come down to that couldn't it I think it absolutely will um and I, I really look forward to get started again because of the talent of the pocket players that are coming in but just the people I'm really excited to work with the people that are coming in and um so we're gonna do some stuff one of our team culture sessions around what it takes to win mm. okay but we're in a very fortunate position that I can actually reword that and put down as what it took to win. Mm. And the girls that were here last year, we can talk about actually, okay, we did this, we did this. We had these challenges at the beginning of the year, but we did this to overcome, we did this to overcome it. And that will then morph into, okay, so for this year, what will it take to win? And I think that is going to be super powerful. And when you go down to training, we'll be able to live and breathe those. And we'll definitely be using some of Mark Bennett's principles mm. um, and we'll keep each other. Well, hopefully they'll keep themselves accountable for what we, think is going to make us win um we then hope to keep each other accountable for that and then if they can't do that then i might need to step in at that point and say right well we said we're going to do this this is what we said is going to mean we're going to be successful and we're not doing it why is that happening what do we need to do differently how are we going to make this be what it needs to be um and i'm really excited to get that going yeah i've, I've just thought of something um again this is just a an idea by all means you know you can do with it what you want most of my <laughs> ideas are pretty wacky i work on the basis of of quantity not quality i throw a lot of quantity at you and one of them might stick and might work <laughs> um but you might want to flip it the other way i've done something in the past which i found quite powerful called a pre-mortem mm, yeah. yeah so this is about yeah. um basically articulating all of the things that could go wrong that would make our season or our culture just dip, dip, fall to pieces yeah. because often people can evoke the negative more easily than they can evoke the positive or it, or it certainly impacts them emotionally stronger so I was, you know what did what did we do to die <laughs> or what did we do to destroy it or you know what did we do to lose whatever it might be but you know almost like sort of playing forward around these are all the things that if we did these things it would destroy us yeah so that you can constantly be on the lookout for them yeah might be an interesting way of framing it yeah, no, I think that's brilliant. And again, back to our conversation um, last year, when mm. you threw some of the challenges I might want to throw forward. As much as I was keen to get into them, I was very aware that I'm this new coach on the block and I'm yeah, going to yeah. do this and who's <laughs> in India kind of doing all these crazy things. Whereas this year, I've had a year, so watch out. <laughs> it's probably my <laughs> out there. Um, but no, yeah, I think that'd be a really great one. Um, mm. And you're absolutely right. It's, it's easy to to really pick apart, okay, well, that actually might happen. And we'll, we actually had a little bit of that last year, but we managed to overcome it. But if that happens again, but worse, what happens? Or this injury happens, or okay, we've only got one drag flicker. What happens if, if they get injured or X, Y, and Z? Mm. And actually, we can really pick apart the things that might go wrong and put interventions in place. Or if they do happen, we're already kind of mentally prepared for them perhaps yeah, yeah. we've already spoke about them yeah i was with i was with the under 18s actually at the weekend um sarah wasn't available on the saturday so i stepped in for her and did some work with andy bradshaw mm. uh, who i'm sure you're very aware of yeah. um around what are the perceived demands of the task yeah. and what is your perceived ability of the task and the gap in between those two is the stress level yeah so if the task is really simple and there's no in inverted commas pressure because pressure is where we band around quite a lot your, your ability is probably pretty fixed. 
And that stress is probably relatively manageable and small in the middle. But if there's a crowd, if you're losing, if things aren't going your way, momentum's not doing what, well, momentum's going the other way, maybe the perceived demands of that task, which a minute ago was, was relatively static and, and easier, might be a bit harder. Yeah. So that line then goes a bit higher. So that stress level gets bigger in the middle, which actually might make your perceived ability decrease. Yeah. Again, that stress level in the middle gets even bigger. Yeah. But actually, how do we handle that stress? What coping mechanisms do we have? Is it the fact that we just need to be aware of it and know that stress is going to be there and overcome it? Um, some of the things that the girls we were working with were suggesting was going back to basics. Okay, don't try to think too fancy. Just get the first touch right. Two, three touches, 30 seconds of, of basic play to then go back into this freedom and creativity, um, which might then decrease the perceived demands, increase the ability to perceive perception of your ability and that stress level then decreases and you can have more um, freedom in the areas that you're potentially going to make are not going to be there so frequently. It's interesting because um, it's just, just thinking about that, a huge generalization, but one of the things that, you know, I've discovered in my career around coaching men and women is I often find that women's perceived ability is far lower than it actually is in general yeah and with boys it's usually the opposite they think they're way better than they are yeah and i think it's a really interesting um topic of discussion maybe not one for none now but i think there is differences between boys and girls males and females mm. um hugely generalized and there's lots of differences between it and the message is always coach the individual yeah not what you think that individual is yeah but there are differences and you speak to danny kerry who delivered a talk to us recently it's a taboo it's a taboo that we talk about the differences between male and female. Yeah. But I think the taboo is holding us back slightly. Yeah. If we now, if we can explore a little bit about, okay, when you're coaching females, these things are probably of slight more importance. Yeah. Actually, when you coach boys, these things have a bit more importance. And actually that might just enhance how we coach those, those people and might then make everything better. Yeah. And there is always generalization. There's always stereotypes and I'm definitely not informed in this subject, but yeah. I do feel that the, we just have to talk about it more. The more we talk about it, the more we discover and the better we will be as a, as an industry. Uh, often people, again, don't want to go into the detail, but often when people talk about this and they, and they challenge it, it's often they talk about the reasons why that is. And, mm. and I, I totally buy into that. I think there are societal challenges that we need to overcome to, mm. to actually address this thing, but that doesn't make them any less real. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, but that is definitely a sociological discussion for a different day and possibly even a different podcast. Mm. Um, Brett, um, talking about perceived demands and perceived ability, um, I've, I've actually now got to sort of jump onto a piece of, a piece of work that is definitely stretching me <laughs> with perceived demands and my perceived ability to do it. Um, but um, I, that is an hour and a half that has literally gone by like the blink of an eye um, mm. And I could talk to you for another hour and a half and I still don't think we'd scratch the surface, but it's been a long time having this conversation and I'm really glad that we were able to do it. I've, I've, I've thoroughly, every time I chat to you, I thoroughly in, enjoy the conversations. I always learn loads of things. Um, I know that people out there may want to get in touch with you because you've said something that they want to find out more about, or they want to understand a bit about your program, or they might want to, um, I know you're very open and very happy to mm. share ideas with people. And, and you've definitely you know, always been keen to, you learn from people, but you always give back in spades. How do they get in touch? So a few methods really. So um, Twitter is always a great one, isn't it? So my Twitter handle is at hockey underscore Brett which is very original. Don't laugh, Stu. We've got webcam here. I know people can't see that in the podcast. But yeah, that is my uh, Twitter handle. And uh, my email is b.holland at elbro, which is l-b-o-r-o dot a-c dot u-k. Mm -hmm. And yeah, absolutely really open to conversations, grabbing coffee, people come down and watch. So you and I both do tutoring with for England Hockey. And quite often people ask, hey, can I just come and watch you? And the answer is always yes. And I'd always massively encourage it. So I know from, from my CPD background, watching other coaches is just a fantastic way of learning. Um, whether it's, I really like that and I'm going to try and embed a bit of that into my practice or actually I wouldn't do it like that. And it probably confirms what, what you think is good practice at the same time. And you often find people that you go and watch or have a conversation with you afterwards. And if you come to Loughborough, we'll certainly do the same. 
I'm sure my partner at home wouldn't enjoy it too much because it means I'm later at home. Um, but if people are going to make that effort, then I'm, I'm more than willing to make the effort reciprocally. That's brilliant. I can't laugh at you for being hockey Brett. I, my, I've got an email address that's reverse sticks to you. So, you know, I'm just, <laughs> just as bad. So. Um, Brett, once again, uh, enormous thanks for sharing your knowledge, sharing what it's like to work in coaching Disneyland. <laughs> uh, um, and I'm hoping that um, as you move forward into the, into the next season and as we're learning more that you'll be prepared to come back on and let's have a conversation about other things that are uh, happening in your world. Mm. Yeah, sounds great. Good stuff. Cheers. Thank you, Stu. See you later. Bye.